Greetings to all physics and physical experiment enthusiasts. I am Andrei Shetnikov, and in today's video I will be discussing the concept of illuminance and its measurement on a surface. And of course, this video naturally commences with a definition, clearly stating that illuminance is the amount of light energy that falls on a unit area of a surface per unit time, as expected, and as is typical in such introductory videos of this nature. Without a doubt, the units utilized in the SI system are remarkably intricate, commonly referred to as lux, and we will discuss how they are defined in the second half of the video, commencing with simple physical experiments that serve to illustrate their measurement and significance. And here I grab a flashlight in my hands, switch it on, and direct it towards the screen positioned behind my back. And when the flashlight is in proximity to the screen, the spot is small in size but highly luminous in intensity. As the flashlight moves away from the screen, the spot gradually increases in size, becoming larger but less illuminated as it moves further away from the screen. And obviously, it is understandable that the flashlight emits the same amount of light energy, but this energy is spread out over various areas, thereby resulting in the level of illumination on the surface where the light source is aimed, which is determined by the distance between this source and the surface it is directed towards. Let's consider a source from which light spreads uniformly in all directions. Through any spherical surface with the centre at this source, the same amount of light energy will pass per unit time interval, but the surface area of a sphere grows proportionally to the square of its radius. Therefore, the illuminance energy per unit time per unit area will decrease inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the source. And now we will test this in practice and for this purpose I have assembled such a specific configuration. Here I possess a source of illumination, a light bulb located within this container. Positioned directly opposite it is the light level sensor. The distance from the light bulb to the sensor window is currently 8 centimeters in length at the present moment in time. The sensor is installed on the platform, which is connected to the motion sensor, ensuring accurate detection and monitoring of motion in the surrounding area. Next, I will transfer the entire system, move it away from the light bulb, and carefully observe how the illumination of the area will gradually decrease over time. However, naturally all of these tasks I will be performing in the absence of light. Furthermore, I ultimately obtained this graph that illustrates the correlation between illuminance and distance. It is evident that illuminance decreases rapidly with distance. I fit the inverse square relationship, and this blue line closely aligns with the experimental points across the entire measurement range. In this way, we can observe how effectively the theory is supported by the experiment and its results. Now let's proceed and take into account another parameter that has an impact on the illuminance of a surface caused by a specific light source. And this is the specific angle at which the light is incident on this particular surface. When light falls perpendicularly to the surface, the illuminated spot is bright. However, when I rotate this surface at increasing angles to the direction of the rays from the source, the spot becomes paler and paler. This is because the same light is now distributed over a significantly larger area, resulting in a decrease in brightness. The change in angle affects the concentration of light, causing the illuminated spot to appear less intense. Let the light beam first fall perpendicularly onto the platform, the width of which we will denote as A. Now we will direct this same beam onto an inclined plane, and the angle of incidence, which is the angle between the direction of the rays and the normal to the plane, will be denoted by alpha. In our triangle, angle alpha is located here, and therefore the width of the inclined platform is now equal to a divided by the cosine of alpha. It turns out that if the area of the light spot when falling at a right angle was S0, then now it has become equal to S0 divided by the cosine of alpha. The area has increased, so the illuminance has decreased. If previously it was equal to E0, now it has become equal to E0 multiplied by the cosine of alpha. The setup for conducting this experiment is arranged in a similar manner, but in this case I positioned a flashlight in such a way that the distance between the light source and the illuminance sensor was increased, and the sensor is positioned on the axis and on the rotational sensor, and I will rotate it in this manner. 
But of course, I will only do this in the dark. And here is the graph showing the relationship between illumination and angle of rotation that I have obtained. We can overlay a cosine graph on it. The agreement overall is not bad, but there are some dips in the data. After all, this sensor is not intended for measuring illuminance at high angles of incidence. And given that we've discussed the inclined angle of light rays striking the surface, it's important to note the Earth's climate zones and seasons. However, we have a separate video dedicated to these topics, and the link will be provided below. In this context, I will include a passage from our previous video, which still reflects our vintage style and serves as a nostalgic reminder. Sun rays fall at varying angles to the vertical in different climatic zones found across the globe. This results in hot temperatures at the equator, moderate temperatures in mid-latitudes, and cold temperatures at the poles. However, that is not all. In reality, the axis of the Earth is tilted in relation to the plane of its orbit around the Sun. This tilt causes the change of seasons. In this position, in the northern hemisphere, the Sun is high overhead at noon, and it is currently summer here. In the southern hemisphere, the sun rises low above the horizon. It is currently winter here. At the North Pole, it is currently polar day, which lasts for six months, while at the South Pole, it is polar night. In six months, everything will change, with winter in the N hemisphere and summer in the S hemisphere. Now we will proceed to discuss photometric or light units. I will commence by introducing a unit such as one candela for measurement of luminous intensity. This is a measurement unit used to quantify the intensity of light. I proceed to light up a candle, creating a warm and comforting glow. And the term candela, when translated from Latin to Russian, is nothing more than a simple candle. And thus, at a specific point in time, the unit of light intensity was established as the light force of a standard candle, serving as a reference for measuring light. I have doubts regarding the standardization of my candle, but by understanding the essence of what a single candle represents, you can gain a clear idea and perception of it. At this moment, I will also proceed to turn on an electric light bulb for illumination purposes. This is a lamp that uses 100 watts of power and emits light through incandescence. The light output of this lamp is 100 times greater than the light output of a single candle, making it significantly brighter. A solitary light bulb has the capacity to replace 100 candles, thereby offering a more efficient lighting solution. This signifies that each watt of power consumed by an incandescent lamp, when operating under its standard conditions, produces a luminous intensity equivalent to one candela. As our understanding of lighting technology has advanced, we now have a standardized unit of measurement for luminous flux, called the lumen, which allows us to accurately quantify the brightness of different light sources. Let's take a light source with an intensity of one candela and let it uniformly emit light in all directions. Then it is stated that this source produces a light flux of 4 pi lumens in all directions. The reason why 4 p appears in this context is because the surface area of a sphere is equal to 4 pi r squared. And this light flux will remain constant and unchanged for any closed surface that encompasses or surrounds our source of light. Now let's have a look at this LED lamp. On the packaging, it is stated that the light flux of the product is 2425 lumens according to the information provided. But we know how to convert light intensity to candelas, divide by 4p, I get 192 candelas. I utilize an LED lamp and obtain a measurement of 192 candelas. However, based on this reasoning, if it were not an LED lamp but rather an incandescent lamp, it would possess a power rating of 192 watts. But here it says that this 25 watt bulb is equivalent to a 225 watt incandescent lamp, not 122. However, there are multiple nuances present in this situation. The issue is that it doesn't shine in every direction. As a result, it fails to cover the entire sphere. Light is unable to pass through from this particular side. Nonetheless, we have a fundamental understanding of the conversion process between the two. And now we have reached the unit of illuminance called lux. Let's once again take a light source with an intensity of one candela, so that it uniformly emits light in all directions. At a distance of one meter from it, we will position a surface onto which the light rays from this source will fall perpendicularly at a right angle. And they say that the illuminance of this surface will be equal to one lux. 
Ideally, now we should also talk about lighting standards. However, our channel is still primarily focused on physics. I am hopeful that the insights and knowledge shared in this discussion will prove valuable to you in navigating and addressing these standards effectively. Now, please feel free to write your comments, ask any questions you may have. We appreciate your attention and thank you very much for taking the time to engage with us. Thank you.